Hi everyone, meteorologist Brian Bennett. Here's your update on Hurricane Dorian for your Sunday, September 1st. Right now, the storm is directly on top of the Bahamian island of Abaco. In fact, folks are probably stepping outside briefly to check out some of the damage, but soon the eastern eye wall will be moving in and it could actually be worse than some of the conditions they've already seen. Winds with the storm are blowing at 185 miles per hour gusting to 220 miles per hour, making it one of the most powerful storms to ever make landfall on planet Earth, at least within recorded history. So we are looking at history right here with Hurricane Dorian, and it breaks my heart to think about the folks that are under the storm right now. Of course, one important question that we all want to know is where the storm will also be heading after it moves through the Bahamas. Here's a look at the National Hurricane Center official track, which by the way, the Hurricane Center is who you should use for official guidance with this storm. The Hurricane Center has it moving westward towards Grand Bahamian Islands as a Cat 5 hurricane, and then possibly stalling out briefly around uh, the western edge of Grand Bahama, and then turning off to the north but knowing that Florida is still in that code of uncertainty, so a landfall in Florida still cannot be completely ruled out, and even the Carolinas have to keep an eye out for a potential landfall as well. Here's a look at the view from GOES-16 or GOES East satellite, and you can see it's really not that far away from Florida, but it's moving so slow that it's gonna take a little bit of time to get into our vicinity, and uh, despite it being close, it, uh, it's going to take a little bit longer for it to get here. All right, I do have some video from the storm. Admittedly, this video is a little hard to watch and listen to, uh, but let me go ahead and, and play that quickly for you here. You can see the storm surge has already taken over the island. You can see that the roofs have already been ripped off. I tell you that that video is is heartbreaking and gives me chills to even watch. Um, okay, moving forward. Uh, where is the storm going to be moving as it moves forward? And the, what I want to show you on this map here is basically where Dorian is right now, which is in the blue color. And the orange color here represents high pressure. And the whole steering is going on based on pressure systems that are around Dorian. We knew this high pressure was going to move down into the southeast, and it was going to block the storm from moving due north. Now the question is exactly how far west will this storm be forced to go around this high pressure? So actually going into the future here with the European computer model, you can see fortunately that high actually erodes right before the storm makes landfall on the east coast of Florida. If that did not happen, this storm would make a direct landfall right over Florida and probably ride right up the spine of the state, possibly making it one of the most expensive storms in U.S. history and not to mention the impact uh, on life in addition to property. But everything is counting on that high pressure to uh, degrade a little bit, and there's really no reason to think that that high pressure shouldn't uh, shrink back briefly to allow that storm to start to turn off to the north. But again, exactly how far uh, that high pressure will shrink back is a big question. And you will notice the track is a little bit farther west as well. Uh, that's because the National Hurricane Center actually flew into the, the high pressure in and out of it and took some readings which gave us a bit more accurate information about the intensity of the high and the proximity of the hurricane. All right, so another thing too we're noticing is that the high pressure doesn't go away for very long. It actually starts to fill back in and that means that the storm won't have quite the tug to move eastward once that high fills back in. So that's why the Carolinas will need to watch the storm very closely as well. All right, so I've, I've looked at a lot of models. I've looked at, uh, I believe I have 12 different models that I have access to, 
And I'm not going to show you all the models. Instead, I'm going to show you the one computer model that I feel like matches the scenario of what I think is going to happen based on my experience with the different global models, regional models, high res models, and kind of their strengths and weaknesses. So the model that uh, seems to kind of fit what I think is going to happen the closest is actually a model called the HMOD model. And you can see here's a storm right now over Abaco. And these winds right here are obviously Cat 5 hurricane winds rotating counterclockwise around the storm. So as we go into the future, the storm is expected to go westward pretty much right over Grand Bahama Island. So if you know of anybody on the island that still has electricity in the Grand Bahama, they obviously know the hurricane, hurricane is coming. But uh, if you want to give them a quick call, uh, just to let them know you love them and that you're praying for them as a storm does head their direction as they would likely be losing electricity for an extended period of time. All right, the storm's going to go westward and then it's going to do something really strange here. As soon as it gets to the very western tip of Grand Bahama, perhaps only maybe 50 miles or so off the east coast of Florida, here's West Palm Beach right here. and. The storm's actually going to stall. It could even wobble to the south a little bit. It could wobble a little east or west. And it's just going to kind of chill out here for a short time. And then the storm is going to wait on that trough of low pressure, that little weakness in the high. And that's going to allow the storm to be pulled north a little bit. Could the storm go farther west and actually make landfall in West Palm Beach? That's a scenario that could happen. I don't trust hurricanes. They're erratic. They have a mind of their own. And unfortunately, we don't have quite the technology to fully sample the atmosphere to be able to get as accurate of a reading as we would like. So just know that if you live in West Palm or areas north, you do need to keep an eye out for this. Stay tuned and be ready to evacuate westward a moment's notice if you need to. Now with that said, it doesn't look like a landfall in Abaco, is got, or excuse me, in, in the West Palm Beach is in the cards, but just know that anything can and, and generally will happen uh, with hurricanes. So the HMOM model, it takes the storm off to the northwest, and I think it is, it's feasible that we could look at a landfall or a very close landfall uh, right, around, uh, uh, right around NASA, right around the Cape area, uh, perhaps just north of Melbourne, uh, just south of Daytona Beach. I wouldn't completely rule out a landfall, especially with this little bit of land here uh, poking out into the Atlantic Ocean. That kind of increases the odds of that happening. Just so you know, this path is a little bit farther west than what the European and the GFS models are calling for. Uh, but generally, these high resolution models do pretty well when we get closer to the storm actually uh, making landfall or closer to the time period uh, that we're talking about because they can handle the, uh, the, the smaller details and the weaknesses of the high pressure that's surrounding the storm. So a landfall is possible in Florida. And I think if it, were for, if it were to happen, it would be most likely to happen, uh, possibly again around Melbourne or the Cape, uh, and again around NASA sticks way out here, so I'm sure they're prepping uh, for these strong winds as well. And time period wise, this would be valid Tuesday night. So Tuesday night would be the most likely time period. Uh, the storm could come very close to making landfall. And then it's going to continue to make a trek off to the northwest. It's possible that if the storm does make landfall uh, right around the Melbourne area, that it could actually stay just on shore uh, before going back off, back out to sea just a little bit. So in this particular model run, the storm is just out to sea. But just know that if it does move on shore, it could actually uh, stay on shore for a time being in northeast Florida. So that's something that we can't rule out. In addition, even if the storm stays out to sea this entire time, notice this very powerful counterclockwise circulation. That is going to bring a lot of wind and water towards land. So storm surge is a very real threat. Coastal beach erosion, flooding, all of that a very big threat. Uh, surfers are probably going to be trying to get out in this. If I could uh, plead with you to not do so, the rib currents are going to be horrible with this, so nobody should be getting in the huge waves that will be forming, especially on the north side of the storm. On the north side, we're going to have storm surge. On the south side, we're going to have what's called negative storm surge, like we had in Tampa Bay with Hurricane Irma. That's because the winds will be blowing offshore. All right, so this is HMON again going forward into the future. Uh, this is actually Wednesday afternoon. Continuing forward, the model thinks that the storm will move 
uh, pretty much due north and then take a turn to the northeast, wrapping around that area of high pressure. This model thinks it's very possible for the storm to actually make another landfall around the Cape Hatteras area, and that's definitely not something I would rule out. Some other models actually agree with that as well. So just know that if you live in the Carolinas, especially coastal North, Car North Carolina, that a second landfall uh, could be a possibility. Now one saving grace will be by the time the storm gets up here, we're only going to be looking at a Cat 1, maybe a Cat 2 hurricane, as opposed to uh, what it will be just offshore of Florida, which will be a Cat 4, uh, maybe even beginning as a Cat 5 hurricane just offshore of Florida. All right, so Hurricane Dorian, uh, one very important graphic to look at here is the possibility for storm surge flooding. That is one of the most dangerous parts of a hurricane. And if you go to this website, nhc.noaa.gov, uh, you can actually go to the storm surge inundation graphic and you can look at your area. It's an inter interactive graphic. I'm not gonna go through every area here. It's just too much coastline to cover in this video, but you can go to your area and see what type of inundation you can expect. The yellow color here represents water on top of land that is normally dry of at least three feet or greater. And just know that storm surge flooding doesn't only happen right along area beaches. It can actually happen well inland. This is the St. John's River and water pushed into the river can actually be pushed uh, 40, 50 miles or so and end up causing flooding way down at the other end of rivers and inlets. And that really becomes the case once you get up into parts of northern Florida and Georgia as well, you notice the storm surge flooding inland. All right, guys, uh, that's, that's a look at the latest. Again, the official Hurricane Center track has a storm staying offshore. I do think it's feasible that the storm could scrape parts of East Central Florida. I definitely would not rule that out. I would be prepared as if the storm were going to make landfall. Uh, this is not the type of storm that you want to be out in your car driving away from. Uh, so the earlier you can be attuned to what's going on, the better. So feel free to zip me a note if you have any questions. Otherwise, everybody, please stay safe out there. And uh, I'll have another update as soon as anything changes or perhaps later this evening or at the very latest tomorrow morning. All right, everybody, stay safe and have a good evening.